Okay, let's start chapter 8, uh, which is Dynamics 2, Motion in a Plane. So chapter 6 taught us about how to solve force problems along a line in one dimension. This chapter goes to two dimensions, so you can consider things like this roller coaster going around uh, on a circular path. So first of all, let's think about the X and Y components of the acceleration. So sometimes they're independent of one another. In which case, what you do is you make a free body diagram, draw some sort of a diagram to solve a problem, and then you use Newton's second law in component form. So the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. This is actually two equations in this chapter. You can use the net force, sum of all the forces in the x direction, equals mass times the, a com the x component of the acceleration and the sum of all the forces in the y direction equals the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object in the y direction. And you find these components by looking at the free body diagram. And then lastly you solve for the acceleration and you can again use the equations of kinematics but now split them up into the x and the y components. And the only thing that's the same on both these sides is the time delta t. Let's review a little bit of projectile motion, uh, sort of from chapter 4. So in the absence of air resistance, uh, if we choose uh, a system where the vertical axis is y, then the force, net force, is in the negative y direction and its magnitude is mg. So the acceleration, a sub x, is equal to the net force in the x direction, uh, which is 0, uh, divided by mass, and the uh, acceleration in the y direction is the net force in the y direction, which is uh, negative mg, divided by the mass, you get negative g. And we solved, it turns out that the position uh, y versus x is a par parabola, so the path of a projectile is a parabola. And if you have different launch angles uh, above the horizontal, you get these different parabolas we found that the range, the distance for an object launched at some angle that lands at the same uh, vertical distance is given by this equation and it has a maximum at theta equals 45 degrees. Now all of this assumes that there's no air resistance. Okay. If you introduce air resistance then the angle for maximum range depends on the size and mass of the object and you can do numerical simulations which tell you that the optimum angle for a sphere, like a baseball, is something less than 45, something like 35 degrees. Uh, a golf ball is not a sphere because it has all the little dimples on it, and that, uh, and also it can be spinning, so it ends up uh, that professional golfers achieve, achieve their maximum range at launch angles of as low as 15 degrees. So if you work out what the acceleration is for a projectile subject to drag, it turns out to be dependent on the uh, velocity. So this acceleration in the x component, uh, x component of the acceleration depends on the instantaneous motion. And same with the y component. So it really is, these components are not uh, independent of each other and there's no way to solve it by just writing down uh, an equation. You have to solve these equations numerically. And these are the kinds of curves that you get when you do this on a computer. And this, these are the solutions for a 5 gram uh, plastic sphere. Here's maximum range of 30 degrees. Okay, I want to introduce a coordinate system for circular motion. And this is a weird one because it's moving as the object moves along a circular path. So here you see this uh, blue ball which is moving on a circular path which goes uh, into the page and out of the page. And uh, we have these three coordinate axes. The red one is R, that points towards the center of circular motion, so that's always changing its direction. The uh, yellow one is T, that's tangent to the circle, and that's always pointing in the instantaneous or the direction of instantaneous velocity of the object. And the z-axis is the one that's constant. It's just pointing perpendicular to the plane of motion. 
Okay, so section 8.2 is on uniform circular motion. So we have a particle and it's moving on a circular path with some angular velocity omega and some speed v, uh, which is a velocity in the t direction. So here's that t axis, which is going round and round, the r axis, which always points towards the center of the circle. The acceleration only has a component in the r direction, and the velocity only has a component in the t direction. So v sub r is 0, v sub z is 0, v sub t is omega times r. As for the acceleration, a sub t is 0, it's not speeding up or slowing down, a sub z is 0, and a sub r turns out to be v squared over r, where v is the speed. We can also write this as omega squared times r. So, an object that's moving in a circular path is not traveling at a constant velocity in a straight line. Therefore, it must have a net force acting on it. Net force is mass times acceleration. The acceleration, again, is in the r direction, and it's v squared over r. So the net force on an object on a circular path is mv squared over r, sometimes called the centripetal force, but it is the net force. And without such a force, the object would move off the, off the circle and end up in the ditch. So here is this plane of motion in a particle in uniform circular motion. The net force is in the r direction. Uh, this must be provided by familiar forces, such as tension if this is a ball going around in a string. It might be static friction if this is a car driving on a circular path. But it's something that's providing this net force, also called centripetal force. Real highway curves are banked by being tilted up at the outside edge of the curve. And so it's possible for this uh, radial component of the, of the normal force can provide this centripetal acceleration needed to turn the car. We'll give an example of that. Okay, so consider a car on a uh, banked curve traveling without assistance from friction. It has to do this at a particular speed. We're going to call that v sub zero, and we're going to find out what that is. So here's a top view looking at the circular path that this car is going on, and uh, the dot there is the center of the circular motion, so the distance from the car to the center is r. And now if we look at a view from behind the car, the rear view of the car, we see that there's some uh, ground, there's the center of the circular motion, and then the ground is banked upwards. And so we'll try to draw that banking angle like that. So if it was flat, it would be like that, but instead there's this angle theta where the car is banked up. And so if you draw the car, uh, sort of the rear view, um, there's the wheels, uh, there's the uh, brake lights, okay, the, the car is driving away from you here. And its uh, velocity is now into the page, but it has an acceleration towards the left now of A is equal to V sub zero squared divided by R, where R is the radius of the circle. And we can draw a free body diagram of the car if we draw a dot, and we have now draw some forces in red, we have the normal force acting perpendicular to the surface, and there's also a uh, gravity force acting straight down, which we'll call m times g, and there's no friction in this case, so we'll just say free body diagram, no friction. Okay, so now our next step is to define some coordinate axes. So we're going to use that same coordinate system from Knight, in which r is towards the center of the circular motion, t is into the page so you can't see it, and this is the z-axis pointing up. And we know that the net force in the z direction is going to be equal to zero, since the object's not accelerating up or down, and the net force in the r direction is what's called the centripetal uh, centripetal force mv sub zero squared divided by r.
And so we want to actually take the normal force and split it up into these two components. So if this is n, uh, then there will be a vertical component. Here is theta. Uh, this will be n sub z, and there will be a horizontal component, n sub r. So we can see right away that n sub r is going to be n times sine theta, and n sub z is going to be n times cosine theta. So now that we know all this stuff, let's move on to the next step, which is to write down these net forces and see what we can solve. So f uh, net in the z direction, which we know is equal to zero, uh, there's going to be the upward component of the normal force, uh, which is equal to n times cos theta, and the only other force is uh, gravity acting downwards, minus mg. So the normal force is an unknown here, so we can solve for it. We find that n is equal to mg divided by cos theta in this problem. Okay, so we'll just remember that value for n, and now move on to the net force in the r direction, which we remember is equal to the centripetal force, mv0 squared over r. And now, look at all the horizontal components. There's only the normal force, n sub r. And so that was equal to n times sine theta. And we're trying to solve for v. We don't know n, but we have it from before, so we're going to take it from the z component and plug it in. And we'll get uh, mv squared over r equals mg uh, sine theta divided by cos theta. And we can see right now that the m's cancel, both sides of this equation. And solving out for v sub 0, we get v sub 0 is equal to the square root of g times r times uh, tan theta, where we've used the identity there, that sine theta divided by cos theta equals tan theta. And so there's our final answer for the critical speed for a frictionless banked curve. Okay, so we've seen for a curve of radius r banked at an angle theta the exact speed at which a car must take the curve without assistance from friction is the square root of rg times tan theta. So consider a car that's going at a speed faster than that. In that case, it would want to slip up the hill, and so you need static friction force pointing down the hill in order to prevent that slipping. The maximum speed occurs when the static friction force goes to its maximum value of mu sub s times n, this normal force. If a car is going slower than square root of rg tan theta, then it will want to slip down the hill so the static friction must uh, point up the hill to prevent the car from slipping down. Now let's move on to circular orbits. So the figure here shows a tower of height h and a projectile which is launched uh, horizontally, so sideways off the top of this tower at some speed v sub 0. If v sub 0 is very small, then you get a trajectory like an A. It simply falls to the ground, and that's a parabolic trajectory. That's called the flat Earth approximation. Now zooming out here, if you increase V, then the range of projectile increases as the ground curves down away from it. So here's curve B faster, here's curve C. It goes all the way to the other side of the Earth. And if this launch speed is sufficiently large, you get to this curve D, where the trajectory never gets closer to the surface. It's parallel to the surface of the ground. And that's called an orbit. So the flat Earth approximation is shown in figure A here. We just have gravity as mg downwards. That's what we've been using up until now. But since actual planets are spherical, the real force is not mg in, in some constant direction, but mg in a direction which is towards the center of a circular orbit. So the acceleration 
of an orbit is uh, g towards the center. And if you equate that to v squared over r, the centripetal acceleration, you can solve for the speed of the circular orbit as being the square root of r times g, where g is this local acceleration due to gravity. And of course, this neglects air resistance, which is very difficult to do here on Earth. So if you were to get just above the atmosphere, the period of a low Earth orbit satellite is 2 pi square root of r over g, which turns out to be about 90 minutes. So it takes about an hour and a half for uh, a low Earth orbit satellite like the Hubble Space Telescope or a Space Shuttle or International Space Station to go all the way around the Earth. And for the occupants of these, uh, these spacecraft, they're continuously in free fall, falling towards the, the center of the Earth. And that's why they feel weightless.